Okay, three, two, one. Hello there. Have you ever wondered, is the brain a computer? Well, it kind of is, and it kind of isn't. Last year, a supercomputer in Japan took 40 minutes simulating just one second of brain activity. This computer had 1.4 million gigs of RAM. My MacBook only has 16 gigs of RAM. And yet, neither my computer nor the Japanese computer can fluently speak or understand human language. Computers cannot read human emotions, understand art, or get jokes. Computers cannot think holistically or perform the tasks of the social brain. And yet, computers can outperform humans at solving math problems, playing chess, and cracking codes. In other words, computers can do everything that's difficult for humans, but not the things that are easy, like having a conversation or reading faces. So, which do you think is smarter, the human brain or a computer? The computer. Okay, and why? Just because the computer, or like, the human brain made the computer, but then with the brain, there's lots of distractions that could like affect it, but then the computer is like always going to be giving you the right answer. The human brain, for sure. Okay, and why? Because, yeah. I mean, just, I've been, like, I've read a few articles uh, on the subject after reading Stephen Hawking talking about uh, artificial intelligence. Human brain. Okay, and why? Because we were created before computers were created. That's what I think. A supercomputer that has, like, thousands of uh, processors connected to like form one thing isn't even a fraction or it can't even uh, produce a fraction of like uh, what the human brain produces in a matter of seconds. So which do you think is smarter the human brain or the computer? None of them. They, really? they, work, they, they work differently. Uh, human brain is, is smart in one way and uh, the computer is smart in another way. Uh, when playing chess, mm -hmm. the computer is smarter. You, you, can't, you can't beat the chess. You can't, you can't beat the computer at the chess. But when uh, thinking about other solutions, uh, there are solutions that the human brain can think of that uh, the computer doesn't think of, like uh, refuting relativity. Einstein's relativity is false. You have to be able to refute that, to reason to, to refute that. The computer doesn't do that. Okay, Amon, so is the brain smarter than a computer? In some cases, yeah. Okay. So I can say that, for example, a computer is smarter to do mathematics mm -hmm. but brain is smarter to generate algorithm so it depends on the case mm -hmm. so, yeah. in the competition between brains and computers the situation is even more unfair for the computer when the computer must also simulate the structure and activity of the human brain this is not only the case for the japanese supercomputer in switzerland neuroscientists hope to understand the brain by building a complete computer simulation of it neuron by neuron if this project succeeds it will be different from other smart computers because the computer is not merely simulating the software of the human mind, it's also simulating the hardware of the human brain. This would actually impose limitations on the computer's intellect by forcing it to solve problems in the same manner as the human brain. What do I mean? Well, let's consider working memory. The RAM on your computer is very similar to the working memory of the brain. Working memory is the ability to keep in mind and manipulate items or instructions for an arbitrary period of time. This is a critical ability for reasoning and problem solving, such as when you must hold several numbers in your head and manipulate them to solve a math problem. On a computer, RAM is the workspace where the operating system and programs run. My MacBook has 16 gigabytes of RAM. This is 16 billion bytes of information that can be kept in the workspace, where each byte is 8 bits, where a bit is a 1 or a 0. Okay, quick, now remember this number. 5845849375854201. Okay, repeat it back for me now. Difficult? Well, that's because human memory can only hold about seven items in working memory. If you were actually able to remember that number, you probably did it by chunking digits into larger numbers that you were already familiar with. For example, if the first five digits were your zip code and the next several digits were important dates or years, like 1492 or 1776, you could easily reduce this very long number to just a few chunks of important numbers. This is actually what chess grandmasters do to remember chess positions from games. They chunk the many pieces into groupings that have strategic significance. If you randomly place pieces on a chessboard without playing them out, so to speak, even a grandmaster will have a very difficult time remembering the position. Even by forming hierarchical representations of information through so-called chunking, 
Human working memory is no match for the many gigabytes of a computer's RAM. Why is human working memory so limited when the brain has 100 billion neurons and about a thousand times as many synapses? One reason is that most of the brain's computational power is not accessible to human consciousness. In other words, the brain is constantly crunching numbers and doing calculations which enable us to perceive objects and coordinate limb movement. These calculations simply aren't available to your mind. If you want to solve a math problem, it must be solved in a sort of global workspace spanning many brain regions which is accessible to consciousness. On a smaller scale, however, neurons are capable of performing arithmetic operations like addition and multiplication and they can even function as logic gates, performing operations like those performed by electrical switches in a computer. These small, local neural circuits are smart in a shallow sense, but they are not capable of the sort of understanding which seems to underlie consciousness. It is possible that this conscious understanding is the missing ingredient required for language. Let's reconsider the Japanese supercomputer, formerly known as the K computer. It took 40 minutes to simulate one second of brain activity. In one sense, the computer is obviously slower than the brain if it runs 2,400 times slower. But perhaps in a deeper sense, this comparison is unfair. Ask yourself, could you perform as well as the computer? Of course you could perform better, you say. After all, you already are the thing which the computer is trying to simulate. But could you simulate your own brain and your mind? Could you use working memory to create a mental simulation of every neuron, receptor, and molecule in your own brain? Of course not. Just saying that you are faster than the computer because you already are the thing it is trying to simulate is cheating in this sense. Is Earth's atmosphere faster or smarter than a supercomputer just because it can compute the activity of every storm, tornado, and hurricane on Earth? In this sense, the universe itself is a vast computer, and we are all living in a simulation. Well, this is a crazy idea, right? Not necessarily. If the universe were a simulation, the programmers would not want to simulate any more detail than necessary to save computational resources. In fact, at the quantum level, energy is quantized in the same way that a digital signal occurs in discrete intervals rather than smooth, continuous quantities. In this view, realizing that energy is quantized is kind of like zooming in on a JPEG image of a flower until it becomes pixelated. But wait, there's more. Subatomic particles such as electrons do not exist as particles until a measurement is made. Until a measurement is made, or the system is disturbed, electrons and, in principle, all matter behave as waves of probability. We know this because electrons will actually diffract and interfere like waves until a measurement is made. In essence, quantum particles exist in many places at once until you make an observation. It is as if nature knows that no one is watching and does not want to give these particles a location until it needs to. The idea that quantum particles exist in many places simultaneously until an observation is made is referred to as the Copenhagen interpretation and is one of the most influential interpretations of quantum mechanics. The physicist Erwin Schrödinger proposed a chilling thought experiment called Schrödinger's Cat to explore the consequences of the Copenhagen interpretation. I recommend starting here for more information. We might never know if we are living in a simulation or not, or if the words simulation and reality have any definite meaning or are merely relative terms, but I still can't help but think how cool it would be to simulate your own brain inside your brain. Would the simulation of your brain also be able to simulate itself? What if your mind is part of a never-ending chain of brain simulations? Until next time, keep those neurons firing. Simulation or no simulation? And what about you, MacBook? Which do you think is smarter? Haha, <laughs> you puny human. You are no match for my superior intellect. The computer will reign supreme over you mortal humans.